Hi everyone, and welcome to part 6 of this formal logic video series. In this session, I'd just like to look at some very useful sub-proofs, uh, which can be put into much larger proofs to help us get to where we want to go. Uh, now a lot of these are going to rely on the negation introduction rule and this principle of explosion that we talked about in a previous session so I'd just like to recap that so that we can really hammer down this sense of anything following from a contradiction uh, and then I'm going to look at four subproofs so A or B not A therefore B A if and only if B not A therefore not B A then B not B therefore not A and not A or B, therefore not A and not B. And then once I've done that, I'm going to look at a proof and just see how knowing these useful subproofs allows us, we can just pop these in whenever we want, uh, whenever we've got the requisite parts, and they're really going to help us to make progress in the proof. Um, and then finally, I'm just going to talk a little bit about how we can reduce the number of steps in our proofs. So thinking of ways that we can make our proofs more elegant. Okay, first of all, I'm not going to recap all of the rules, but I thought it would be nice to just look at the negation introduction rule before we carry on, because a lot of proofs rely really heavily on the negation introduction and, to some extent, using the negation elimination rule in combination with that. So here we've got two configurations that we're going to be seeing a lot of. Um, here's just the standard negation introduction rule, so if we assume phi uh, and then we show that phi leads to a contradiction, so if on the same uh, scope bar we have an assumption of phi and then two contradictory premises here psi and not psi, then we can write the negation of that assumption, so we can write not phi here. So if we were looking to get to a negated formula, not phi, you know, whether that's not A, not A or B, whatever, uh, one way of doing that would be to assume the unnegated form of that and then uh, somehow get two contradictory premises on the same scope bar, and we could get that. Um, now another, way, another thing that we're often going to find is that say we wanted to get to phi, uh, what we can do is ass assume the negation of phi, so this is going to be an indirect proof, uh, let's write that down, indirect, Oops. we'll assume the negation of phi, then show that that leads to some kind of contradiction, so here we've got psi and not psi, and that will give us not not phi, so we can add another negation on, and of course then the negation elimination rule allows us to get phi. Uh, so again, thinking about how we might get to, with proofs, it's always good to think about what am I trying to get to, and what kind of structure could I use to introduce that. So these two structures are going to be really, really common in our proofs. Um, if we want to get a negated formula, then quite often we'll do it by assuming the unnegated form and doing a negation introduction, and if we just want a formula, an unnegated formula, sometimes it's going to be, the easiest route is going to be to do an indirect proof. So to assume the negation of that formula, show that that leads to a contradiction, and then get kind of not not phi in this case, uh, and use a negation elimination. So using the negation introduction and negation elimination rules in combination is going to be very common. Okay, so first of all, let's revisit our principle of explosion. So remember that the principle of explosion can be summed up as anything follows from a contradiction. So what do we mean by that? Um, well, let's have a look at uh, a proof. So we'll be doing a categorical proof of, let's say, A, then B, or A. Okay, now we know that this is a theorem because we can quite quickly do a truth table for this. So the truth table for A, then B, if, if this has got kind of standard, uh, you know, A is true, true, false, false, and B is true, false, true, false. This is going to be true, true, sorry, true, false, true, true. Uh, A is going to be true, true, false, false. So the disjunction of that is going to be true, 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 true. Okay, so. We've got all true here, so we know this is a tautology, so it's definitely going to be possible to categorically show uh, that 
A then B or A. So let's think about how we might go about this. Uh, I'll put in our conclusion, so on line Z let's write A then B or A. Now just looking at this, its main operator is a disjunction. Um, so if we had A or if we had A then B just on their own here, uh, we would be able to introduce this by disjunction introduction. Um, however, having a think about that, A then B uh, and A on, its, on their own don't look like uh, theorems. They're not things that we could introduce. Uh, they're not tautologies, right? We couldn't introduce them uh, with no premises. So it looks like the disjunction introduction idea isn't going to work. So what else could we try? Well, we've just said that often the best way of going about uh, introducing a formula is by indirect proof. So we'll assume it's negation and then because we know this is a tautology, the negation of a tautology has to be a contradiction. So if we assume the negation of a tautological statement, it should lead to some kind of contradiction and then we can introduce uh, the formula itself. So we can say not not the formula and then the formula. So let's do exactly that here. So what we'll be looking to do is introduce this formula not not a then b or a so we'll be doing a negation elimination uh, and that means that we're going to need to have a subproof another scope bar that starts with not a then b or a as its assumption. So that's going to be an assumption up here. In fact, let's just get rid of this so we can see a bit more clearly. So we now need to find our contradictory premises to go on this line. Now, one thing we might think of doing is just introducing uh, the unnegated form of this formula, so introducing A then B or A. And we could do that if we had A then B or A just on their own. Um, now remember we, we thought that down here uh, but the problem was well that's not something that we can introduce without premises uh, so why should we be able to do it here now? Well remember that we've now got an assumption to play with. We can now start making use of this negated formula uh, in order to introduce further formulas. So uh, if we could end up with say A then B then we could introduce A then B or A and that would contradict this assumption so that would allow us to uh, add another negation on and get not not A then B or A and therefore to get A then B or A so how could we introduce this well let's just speed through a bit it's a conditional statement, so the easiest way to introduce a conditional is with uh, it's just by doing a conditional introduction. So that requires us to have a subproof that begins with the antecedent as an assumption. So that's the assumption that A, and it has to end with B. Okay, so now our question is, well, how how are we supposed to get down to B? Well, let's just remember that everything follows from a contradiction. So do we have, or could we construct, any contradictory formulas? Well, we've got this not A then B, or A, and we've now got A. And remember, our plan on this line is to get one half of the disjunct here, right? The unnegated formula is A then B, or A. So if we get A then B, we could introduce A then B, or A, and that's contradictory. If we got A on its own, then we could introduce A then B or A with a disjunction introduction. And here we've just assumed one half of that disjunction. So we're now in a position to create a, uh, a contradictory formula. We can always just create uh, a, a then B or A once we've assumed A, because we can just do a disjunction introduction. So we can create our contradictory formula uh, at any point now, we just need to work out, well, what is it that we want to introduce? Well, we want to introduce B. So again, let's have a look up here. 
we don't have b as the consequent of any conditionals it's not going to be easy to introduce it using any other of the other rules that we have but if we do an indirect proof that is if we assume the negation of b show that that leads to some kind of contradiction and then we so we end up with not not b in our case we can get b that's going to work for us so let's assume on this line b so now we just need to show that b leads to some kind of contradiction but we already know we already have our contradictory formulas right we've got a and we've got this form so we can create a contradictory formula here so if we reiterate here line 1 not a then b or a so that's one reiteration and we also reiterate a then on line 6 we can write a then b or a just with a disjunction introduction and that's going to get us, there's our contradiction, right? We've got not A, then B, or A, and A, then B, or A. So, now you might be thinking, look, you said, a con you know, we need to find, when we do a negation introduction, the point is that the contradiction is supposed to follow from the assumption in some way. And A, A then B, or A, and not A, then B, or A, a don't seem to follow from B at all. They don't have anything to do with B, really. Um, okay, B is involved in this, but we didn't introduce it using B. But that's okay. When we say that the assumption has to lead to a contradiction, all we mean is that you have to be able to get a contradiction uh, through the rules that we use. And here we're just using the rules of reiteration. So we're reiterating up previous uh, from previous scope bars, assumptions that we've already made. Uh, and then we're using the disjunction introduction rule so that's line 5 disjunction introduction and that of course gets us sorry this should have been not b <laughs> we should have assumed not b and that will give us not not b on line 7 which then we can on line 8 turn into b so kind of a bit squashed here uh, not not b is from 3 4 and 6 negation introduction and then that's from line 7 negation elimination and then the rest of the proof is quite straightforward right we've already filled out this bit uh, 2 to 8 gives us this conditional uh, and that's on line 9 10 Let's renumber all of this so a then b or a comes from 9 and a disjunction introduction and then this contradicts our initial assumption so this is going to be from 1 1 10 negation introduction remember we need to state uh, premise 1 is both our assumption and also one of the contradictory premises right so these two uh, contradict one another they can't possibly exist on the same scope bar so that gets us our not not a then b or a and so we can then just do a negation elimination on 11 to get to A then B or A. Okay, but the point to take away from this was that uh, once we had introduced this formula, once we'd introduced this A, so we started off with an indirect proof, uh, we needed to think a little bit about what we could then do with this formula. Right, if we could create the unnegated form of this formula, then we're going to be able to uh, that that would be contradictory and we could do that by having either one of these disjuncts so A or A then B uh, or getting A and that's what we did here we tried to get A then B and we did that by assuming A and then thinking right now we're in a position to create a contradiction and because a con uh, anything follows from a contradiction of course we can get B right all we need to do is do an indirect proof so we know we can create a contradiction so we'll assume the negation of what we want that was this B here uh, and then we can reiterate our contradictory formula. So the contradictory formula from line 1 and then create the second formula from reiterating line 2. And we get this contradiction here. Uh, and the important thing to remember is that when we say uh, that B leads to a contradiction, uh, let's write this down, 
B leads to a contradiction. We don't mean here that we used B itself and some rules to generate these two, because actually we didn't make use of this assumption. Line 3 doesn't appear in any of the rest of the lines for that scope bar. Right, so that would be these three. Uh, don't, don't mention line 3 where B is. Um, but what we mean by that is that we can use the rules of PL Uh, to generate um, contradictory formulas or to generate a contradiction on the same scope bar right, and that's all that we need right? remember our rule for negation introduction doesn't tell us uh, right, these the rule for how psi and not psi were introduced uh, that's left a mystery, right? We, we can introduce it in any number of ways, and it doesn't have to relate to the assumption that was made at the beginning of that scope bar. They can come from reiteration or, uh, you know, from, from anywhere that we want or any way that we can. Um, so I just really want to hammer home that thought that the fact that B leads to a contradiction doesn't mean that it has to be literally B or the u and using that line that created the contradictory formulas. It could just be from reiteration. As long as we're using the rules of PL to get two formulas on the same scope bar that began with that assumption, uh, and these two formulas contradict, then we can write the negated form of that formula. Um, and that's a really useful thing to remember. Um, it's, it's easy to, when, when you hear, oh well, it has to lead to a contradiction in order to show that, you know, in order to do a negation introduction, Oh well, I can't use it really. I can't make any use of it. Just remember, it doesn't. You don't have to make use of that formula itself. We could just reiterate other formulas up there that are contradictory. So let's now move on to look at uh, these useful subproofs. So first of all, uh, A or B, and not A, therefore B. Now hopefully, uh, it's obvious why this is provable, why we can derive B from A or B and not A. Uh, if we know that A or B is the case, and we know that A isn't the case, then B must be the case. Um, so we should be able to do this. Let's just have a think about how we might do it. Um, well, the first way would be if we could just use a rule to derive B, but that doesn't look like it's going to work because we don't have uh, B is the consequent of any formula. We don't have any biconditional statements uh, leading to B from which we can just eliminate the rest of the formula. Um, so what else could we try? Well, in this case we've got a disjunction, so let's try a disjunction elimination. So remember, with a disjunction elimination what we need to do is show that both A, uh, this, both sides of this disjunction, so A leads to B and B we need to show leads to B. Well, one side's really easy, uh, and can just be one line long. This line three, this assumption of B, shows that B leads to B. Right? There's a subproof that begins and ends with B. So that's one side of that done. Now we just need to show that if we, on line four, assume A. We need to show that this leads to B. Um, again, something I haven't said uh, too much in this session is that we can draw in all of this structure as soon as we've decided we're doing a disjunction elimination. Um, we, if we know the rule for disjunction elimination, we know that we need these two scope bars. Uh, so we can just draw in the whole structure of our proof. And again, that's something that's very useful, uh, I've said in several of the other videos. So I would put that into practice, always be drawing in as much of the proof as you can, right? all of the scope bars that you can. Um, if you make a mistake it doesn't matter too much, you can just rub it out, um, but it does help you get some sense of where the proof is going. Um, okay, right, back to this. So, we're trying to show that A will lead to B. Um, well, how might we do that? Well, if we look back at the rest of our proof, we've got not A here, and we've just assumed A. So let's remember our principle of explosion. Anything will follow from a contradiction. 
And the way that we do that is just to assume the negation of what we want and then to reiterate our two contradictory premises. So in this case, we want to get to B. So if we assume on line 5, if we start with the assumption of not B, so we negate what it is that we want, then we can just reiterate up these two contradictory premises. So on line 2, we get not A. That's a reiteration of 2. And we also get A from line 4. And that's, sorry, that's, that's 6, 7. Uh, and so there we go. We've got an assumption that leads to a contradiction. So on line 8, let's change our Z to a 10. So on line 8, we can write not, not B. And that's from 5, 6, 7, negation, introduction. And so therefore, on line 9, we can write B by doing a negation elimination of 8. And that's given us our disjunction elimination for line 10. So that's going to be from 1, 3 to 3. Remember, we still need to state that it's a range. So we're showing it's a subproof. So 3 to 3, even though it's just one line. And 4 to 9 disjunction elimination uh, gives us our conclusion. So there we go. So this structure um, is we're always going to be able to rely on this. So we could we could write it again in terms of uh, phi and psi. So if we had phi or psi and we had not phi, then we always know that what we could do, so it doesn't matter what these formulas are now, right? we can put this in the abstract uh, if we just assume psi, that shows that psi follows from psi. Uh, then, if we assume phi, we can assume not psi and get not phi and phi up onto that scope line and thereby show not not psi, so psi, and therefore get to psi. So let's just number that. Uh, so this structure here uh, that we've put in terms of phi's and size, you can imagine that this doesn't have to be this this here doesn't have to be the main scope bar. This could be any scope bar, right? We this could be a subproof that we put into any uh, much larger proof where we have a disjunction and then we have the negated form of one half of that disjunction, right? So here we've got psi, phi or psi, and we've got one half of it negated. And of course, if we had not psi, we could just do exactly the same, but with the other disjunct. Um, so this is a real, and it's a 10-step subproof that's really, really useful. It's going to come in handy in all kinds of different proofs that we'll look at, or, or that you might have to do. Um, as we'll see uh, towards the end of this video. Um, and I think it is always worth having it in the abstract as well, so that we can remember that this could be any, right, if we had, uh, so here we've got A or B uh, and not A, but, you know, if, if we'd been trying to prove, uh, I don't know, A then, A then B or Z and X or F, and we already knew know, not A then B, then we know immediately that we can show uh, the other side of that, right, the Z and X or F, right, because these formulas phi and psi could stand for any one of these. Okay, let's move on to the next subproof uh, that I'd like us to look at. So this time we've got A if and only if B, not A, therefore not B. So again, let's write in our conclusion of not B. Again, hopefully the uh, the logic behind this is quite clear. Uh, if we've got A if and only if B, we know that the truth table for that looks something like this. True, false, false, true. So we know that this comes out true 
in the first case where we've got a so if we had a we know that b must also be the case but it's also true where they're both false so if we know that a if and only if b and we know that not a we should be able to derive not b right because it's true in that case um, now our rule for biconditional elimination doesn't allow us to make that step right we can only derive one half of this statement if we have the other can't at the minute do anything with the negated form of one side so we're going to need to do a little subproof to get from uh, a if and only if b and not a down to not b um, okay well what kind of things could we do well let's think back again to what I said at the beginning if there's no obvious way of introducing this we can't uh, we can't do any kind of biconditional elimination then what we should think about doing is some kind of indirect proof right so if we want not b then perhaps we can do that by assuming the kind of unnegated form of that so on line three let's assume b so there's our assumption so now we just need to see whether b leads to some kind of contradiction well what could what do we have to play with well we've got this by conditional so let's reiterate that up there a if and only if b that's a reiteration of one remember we can always move things up from left hand scope bars uh, so we can get up to here so a sorry b and a if and only if b can give us a on line five that's from three and four by conditional elimination and now we've got not a on our main scope bar and then on a scope bar immediately to the right we've got a contradictory premise so we can reiterate up not a onto here to line six and there we go we've got our contradiction so that's a reiteration of two and that allows us to say three five and six negation introduction to get us our b on line seven so again we've we've used in a way albeit kind of indirectly we've used the principle of explosion right we found that we can create a contradiction uh, and thereby you know we've had our subproof that begins with an assumption and leads to in this case it, it really it, you know it leads in a much stronger sense to the contradiction because we've had to make use of this line with our assumption on it in order to get there uh, you know the B has actually played an integral part in getting us a and therefore creating a contradiction with what we already knew which was not a but again this is going to be a very useful subproof for us to have it's it's going to be something that we're going to want to make use of when we can or at least to, to think that and if we've got a by conditional so if we've got phi if and only if psi and we've got not phi or you know perhaps we had not psi then we know that by assuming the other side psi we can get down to uh, so that would give us phi and not phi which would mean that line 7 we could write not psi um, so this is going to be really useful to remember that um, and also it's worth thinking about the if we if we kind of add negations to these the same the kind of we can do it the opposite way around so it's probably easier just to write this out so you can see uh, if we've got not phi if and only if not psi and we know kind of the negate the unnegated form of one of those so if we know phi then we can do exactly the same thing we'll just kind of the other way around right so on line three what we'll do is we'll assume uh, not psi so we know that not psi if and only if sorry not phi if and only if not psi so that allows us to get not phi and then we've got again another contradiction so on line six we can write phi by reiterating it and on line seven that allows us to write not not psi and therefore on line eight psi right, so again it's, it's going to work both ways if we add negations on it kind of means that we have to do a little bit more work uh, and it's 
we're kind of doing it the other way around with the negations, but it's the same process that's that we're going to be using. So again, I think this is a very useful subproof. I've not given the justifications here on the right hand side. Um, you know, this is an assumption, a reiteration of one. Uh, that's three, four, by conditional elimination, two reiteration, and then that allows us to do three, five, six. Negation introduction, I won't do it for the other one. But this structure is, is again, whenever we have, this doesn't need to be the main scope bar here. This could be any scope bar in a proof, and so long as we have on that scope bar a biconditional and a negated form of one half of that, or again here we've got you know, a biconditional connecting two negated statements, and if we've got the unnegated form of one of those, then we can derive the unnegated form of the other. Right, this doesn't have to be the main scope bar, it can be a subproof in any number of much larger proofs. Um, so again, one to remember and to think about that we could put into use uh, in larger proofs. Okay, moving on to our next proof. So here we're looking at A then B, not B, therefore not A. Um, so the logic in this one is going to be, if we know that A entails B, and we know that B isn't the case, then A can't be the case. Because if it was, then B would be the case, because A entails B. So if we know that not B, we should be able to derive not A. And bear in mind that this bears some resemblance to a fallacy. Right? So we have these two fallacies, uh, A then B, uh, not A, therefore not B is a fallacy. Right? So that's not good reasoning. That's called denying the antecedent. Uh, so this form of reasoning is valid, whereas this one uh, is not. Okay, so bear in mind that we're not we're not kind of committing a fallacy here. This is a different uh, structure. This is a, a good way of using conditionals. Um, so how might we go about solving this? Um, well, seeing as a negation is the main operator of this formula, right? we're, we're trying to get to not a. Uh, we might try doing an indirect proof. So let's see if we assume. Uh, the unnegated form of this, if we assume A, and then let's see if that leads us to some kind of contradiction. Well, what can we make use of up here? We've got A then B, uh, and not B. Well, the only thing that this really looks like it's going to be useful for is this conditional, so let's reiterate that up there. That's from line 3, uh, sorry, that's from line 1. One reiteration, and then 3 and 4 give us we can derive B on line 5, so that's going to be uh, 3, 4, conditional elimination. And now, again, just like in the last example, we've got our two contradictory premises. So we can reiterate up onto line 6 and not B from line 2, and there we've got our two contradictory statements. Yeah, so this is going to be line 7 and that's going to give us, that's going to be from 3, 5, 6 negation introduction. So here again is a really useful proof. Uh, let's write that in its kind of more abstract form. Phi's and psi. So if we've got phi then psi and we know not psi, then by assuming the left hand side, the antecedent of this conditional, if we assume phi, we can use the conditional to get psi, but of course psi has already been contradicted by one of our one of our initial premises. So six not psi and therefore uh, not phi by negation introduction. So assumption uh, one reiteration, what's that, three, four, conditional elimination, and then three, sorry, two, reiteration, and then three, five, six, negation, introduction. 
Uh, okay, same as before. This, uh, the scope bar here, this doesn't have to be the main scope bar. This could be any scope bar within a proof, and as long as we've got these two premises, uh, we can we can do this subproof on that scope bar. Right, so, and again, that's it's just something to think about. If I've got uh, a formula, you know, two formulas, I've got phi then psi, and I've got the negation of the consequent. Any you know, any conditional and the negation of its consequent, I can derive the negation of its antecedent. That's just something to bear in mind when we're doing our proofs. It's a way that we could we could make this move. Um, in order to make, you know, maybe that's going to help us to make some progress. Yeah. Okay. Let's have a look at one more proof, one more subproof. Um, so I don't know why I've written that there. Uh, so we want to get from not A or B to not A and not B. Um, now, hopefully, we can just reflect for a second and see that if the disjunction of A and B is false, so this is like saying neither A or B is the case, then it must be the case that not A is the case and not B is the case, right? Because neither of them are the case, which is just exactly what this says. So, this is what we're trying to move down to: not A and not B. Um, well, how are we going to get down here? Well, it looks like we're going to need to get both of these on their own. Right? We're going to need to have had not B somewhere and not A. And then we can introduce them via a conjunction introduction. Um, so how can we get either of those? Okay, well, let's just think again of our indirect proofs, right? Let's. How could we get not A? Well, let's think about try assuming the unnegated form of this. So if we assume A on line 2, that's a premise, that's an assumption, what can we do with A in order to get some kind of contradiction? Well we know that not A or B is the case, so if we could get the unnegated form of A or B, as in just A or B, then we can reiterate this up onto line 4, not A or B to get our contradictory premises A or B and not A or B but of course we can make this step from 2 to 3 just by using a disjunction introduction the easiest rule in logic we can just add on disjuncts in that way so there we get uh, that's a reiteration of 1 so on line 5 we've done 2, 3, 4 negation introduction and then we can just repeat exactly the same thing for the other side. So if we assume B, then we can introduce A or B, 6, 7, and on a line 8, we can reiterate not A or B. So that was an assumption, 6, disjunction introduction, and reiteration of 1. And there again, on line 9, we can introduce not B from 6, 7, and 8, negation introduction, uh, and then on line 10, that's a conjunction introduction of 5 and 9. Um, now, it's only really one, you know, once we can do one half of this, once we can get not A from not A or B, we can do the other half. So I'm just going to, as the kind of abstracted version. I'm just going to say if we've got not phi or psi, then by assuming phi, we can say phi or psi, uh, and that's from 2, disjunction introduction, and then just reiterate up not phi or psi. Let's just move these out a little bit more. Assumption, uh, 2, disjunction, introduction, and then that's 1, reiteration. And so that lets us put uh, on line 5, our not phi. Okay, so this formula here 
uh, this subproof, sorry, uh, again, we're going to be able to make use of this in any number of much larger proofs. Um, put the rule in there, two, three, four, negation introduction. Um, so if we've got the negation of a disjunction, we just know that we can derive the negated form of either of the disjuncts within that uh, formula. Uh, using this system. And again, that's just going to be very useful to remember when we're stuck in a proof, uh, just to think, look, if this is, this could, again, could be any scope bar, uh, it doesn't have to be the main scope bar, just so long as we have the negation of a disjunction on any scope bar at all, then we can perform this operation. Now, one final thing to just think about before we move on to look at longer proof is just this thing about the interchangeability uh, or, or what happens when negations kind of get added in or taken out. So let's think again about our uh, A or B, not A, therefore B. There's a kind of relationship that holds between the uh, atomic formulas here and the negations attached to them, that if, you know, suppose, because we know that this is the case, we can prove this, A or B, not A, for B, hopefully it's obvious to see why if we have this disjunction, not A or not B, and we have A, then we can derive uh, not B. Right, so we've kind of swapped the negations around here. Um, in this case, what we really need is, if you think about, and you know, we need the opposite of one of the disjuncts in terms of negation, in terms of truth value. So we've got A or B, and we, then we know that the opposite of one of those disjuncts is the case. Uh, not A is the case, so we can derive B. In this case, we've got not A or not B, and again, we've got the opposite of one of the disjuncts. We've got the opposite of not A, A. Right? We know that the opposite of what's expressed here is true, so we can derive the other side. Um, and again, you know, if we had A or not B, and we had not A, then we could derive not B. Right, so these it's worth thinking about, the same goes for the other formulas that we looked at, right? If we have uh, A if and only if B, and I said if we had not A, then we could get not B, because if this was not A if and only if not B, then the same kind of thing is going to be possible if we've got the opposite form of this in terms of negation, right? If we've got A where we had not A if and only if not B, then we should be able to derive B. Yeah, so that's just something to bear in mind that uh, you know here we've got negations added in um, and sort of missing in these in these cases. They can be swapped around in this way, um, and hopefully it's obvious to see that we're we're really just going to be performing the same kind of operation in doing this. There's not a great deal of difference in the structure of the proof uh, in each of these cases or in these two cases. Um, the structure is going to be exactly the same, it's just that there's a difference of, you know, the negations have been turned around the other way, in some sense. Uh, but that shouldn't, that shouldn't worry us. If we think that's why it's good to think about these things in terms of a structure, um, because then we don't need to work out in each case what we're doing. We can just think, right, there's a certain structure that allows us to move from a biconditional and kind of the opposite of one of the biconditional, uh, one of the things being connected by that biconditional uh, leading to the other side. Okay, so now let's look at these things, these subproofs being used in a much longer proof. Okay, so here I'm trying to prove the sequence not C and A then B, not B if and only if not F, and C or not F or G, therefore not A. So let's just have a quick think about how, what route I might take to get there. Um, I'm trying to get to not A, that's going to be my conclusion, uh, and just having a look at our premises here, we've got this conjunction here of not C and A then B, so I could get each of these conjuncts uh, on their own, I could get A then B, so I would have A then B, and just having a look again, where are we, up here, if we've got A then B, and the negation of the consequent, then we can derive the negation of the antecedent. So that might be one route that we could take through this. If we can somehow get not B here, then we can just use that subproof that we saw before. We can assume A, 
use the conditional a then b to get b and then reiterate not b from there up to here to thereby negate the assumption to get not a so maybe that's a nice way that'd be a, you know a reasonable way of looking at doing this proof of how we're going to get there let's move that out of the way um, so let's try that then um, so let's move down a bit and down here I'll put on line Z uh, that we're trying to get not a and the way that we're going to do that is by so we said we're going to assume a and then reiterate this conditional to get B and then reiterate not B to get not A. Now that's going to be the end of our proof. So what we really need to do is to establish not B. Uh, or in fact we need we need both A then B from that conjunction at the top and we also need not B. So we know that we can get uh, this formula here Right, we can just get that from our conjunction at the top. We can just do a conjunction elimination on that. So let's write that in, conjunction elimination. Uh, the puzzle is how are we going to end up with not B? So let's just, I mean, sometimes the best way to go through these proofs is just to, just to have a go, and just to think about what we might be able to do. So we're trying to get to not B. Um, let's try doing an indirect proof to get there. So, I can already draw in my structure. I know that with an indirect proof, I'm going to assume not B, uh, and then I'm going to just try and end up with some kind of... Sorry, I'm going to assume B. I'm going to assume the unnegated form of the formula I'm trying to find, so I'm trying to get to not B. So let's assume B, uh, and then I'll try and see if that leads to some kind of contradiction. So, what can we do with this? Um, well, just looking at our premises, if we reiterate line 2 onto line 5, not B, if and only if, not F, remember we've already looked, uh, where are we, at this, we've seen that there's this useful, useful subproof, we've got A, if and only if B, and we've got not A, then we can get not B, um, or again, if we've got not phi, if and only if not psi, and we've got phi, then we can get psi. And that's what we've got here. Right, we've got not B if and only if not F and we've got B. So we should be able to derive F just using exactly the same uh, subproof that we had before. So the way we did that was to assume not F. Sorry, and that was a reiteration of 2, wasn't it? Uh, so we assume not F, then we reiterate that statement, so not B if and only if not F, that's a reiteration of 5, uh, and then on line 8 we can say not B from 6 and 7 by conditional elimination, but then we can reiterate up our assumption of B from line 4, so on line 9 we could write B, uh, and thereby we've got our contradictory premises, uh, contradictory formulas, right? We've got B and not B. So, on, let's get rid of some of this scope bar. On line 10, we could write not not F, and then on line 11, F. So, that was four reiteration. Not not F is going to be six, eight, and nine negation introduction and then that's 10 negation elimination okay so I've gotten to F so there, there again we've just picked up as it were this subproof uh, from up here where where are we this subproof here uh, we've just picked all this up and just popped it in just added in the formulas that we needed uh, and just made use of it here to get from B to F knowing that we already had this um, Okay, where do we go from here? Well, we've got F. Let's have a look at some of our other premises. We could get not C from here, and we've got C in this disjunction. So, 
maybe we could get some kind of contradiction there. We can get not C out of this easily enough just by doing a conjunction elimination. Here we're going to need to do some kind of disjunction elimination. So C obviously follows from C, that's fine. Um, but does it follow from not F or G? Well, what we need to do is construct some kind of... If we had F or G, then we could get it from it, right? We know that if we've got something of this form, uh, phi or not psi, and we've got psi, because that's the unnegated form of one half of this, so it's the unnegated form of this disjunct, um, we could do a subproof. In fact, we need to do a disjunction elimination, so we could show that phi follows from phi, and then from not phi, well, what we need to do is assume not phi, and then reiterate our not psi and psi. Right, and that would lead us to not not phi, and therefore phi. So we've shown that phi comes from this side, and it also comes from the other. Right, so we could get uh, phi on its own. So can we do something similar here? Can we? We need, we would need f or g. Um, and we've got f. Well, again, we can just use the easiest rule in logic here so that on line 12 we can write f or g and now we're in a position where we've got the contradictory premise that we need or we can we've got the uh, contradiction to one half of this disjunction so we should now using that subproof that we just looked at be able to derive the other half we know that c or not f or g is the case and we know that uh, and we've assumed or through this assumption it's led us to F or G, so we should be able to show that C must be the case. So let's just put that subproof into action. Um, so let's we'll go back up and have a quick look at what we need to do. Uh, okay, so no, it's not that one, it's up here. So the subproof is uh, we need we can assume one side uh, and that will just show that that side follows from that side uh, and then we need to assume the other side and we'll use we'll kind of do our principle of explosion we'll have our contradictory premises then uh, to make use of um, so we've got f or g so we need to reiterate up the disjunction uh, in order to make use of it so c or not f or g uh, sorry that's from 11 disjunction introduction um, and here this is a reiteration of line 3 so we're going to need to let's draw our scope bar a little longer getting this down to here so uh, so we want to get C from this. So again, a really short subproof. We can say the assumption of C. That's all we need to show that C follows from C. Then we need another subproof that's going to go from not F or G uh, and going to end in C. So there, that's an assumption. Uh, and, we, and again, we can just use the same structure. So we've got um, a disjunction and a formula that contradicts one of the disjuncts. So it contradicts this. Uh, let's just underline it so we can see. This contradicts this. Oops. Yeah, just these parts. So if we assume the negation of what we want so on line 16 we'll introduce a new subproof beginning with not C um, all we need to do now is reiterate up our contradictory premises so on line 17 we can reiterate up from line 12 F or G so that is 12 reiteration on line 18 we can reiterate uh, from 15 not F or G so that's 15 reiteration 
and there we've got our two contradictory premises so let's get rid of a bit of that scope bar on line 19 we can write not not c from 16 17 18 negation introduction and that means that on line 20 we can have c from 19 negation elimination okay so we've now shown that c comes from either side of this right we use that useful little sub proof uh, to go from f or g and c or not f or g just to get c on its own so that'll be on line 21 um, and now remember our plan was to get c on its own and then get not c out of this conjunction to create two contradictory premises so we're going to need to reiterate line one up here so oh sorry we need to put in, let's put in our justification for that as well so that's 13 uh, 14 to 14 and then 15 to 20 disjunction elimination and then we'll reiterate up line one so that's not C and A then B that's one reiteration and then on line 23 we can write not C by doing a conjunction elimination of 22 and now we've got our two contradictory premises so we can do our negation introduction of B so that's from line 4 it's down here on line 24 uh, so this is what we were asking how do we get to B well it's from line 4 21 and 23 and a negation introduction 25 that was from line 1 conjunction elimination uh, assumption then this was so 26 27 was 25 reiterated and then B was a conditional elimination so on line 28 we had 26 27 conditional elimination not B was a reiteration of 24 so 24 uh, reiteration and then those two were contradictory so 26 28 and 29 negation introduction gives us our not A on line 30 and there we go that's the end of our proof now there was I knew roughly where I was going um, but we could have done a lot of that through trial and error right we could have thought let's you know start off if we assume saying that you know we worked out if we could get not B then we could do this how might we get not B well let's assume it's you know the unnegated form let's assume B uh, and see where that takes us and when we just used a lot of these sub proofs that we've gone through in this session to to make some progress right we knew that B and not B if and only if not F would lead us to F um, we knew that okay the easiest rule in logic can get us from F to F or G and that gives us the co a contradictory formula to one of these disjuncts and so now we know well look if we've got a disjunction and a contradiction to one of the disjuncts we can get the other disjunct All right, and we did that and then we thought okay our first premise has got not C in it so there we go we can just create this contradiction um, so hopefully you can see that these sub proofs just by knowing them just by knowing that we can make these kind of steps and it's always got the same structure right this uh, you know C or not F or G and F or G is the same amount of steps that gets us from these two down to C as it was when we looked at it uh, in its more abstract form uh, up here right it's always going to be 10 steps that gets us there so you can just pick that up and put it in in whatever form you need it um, and there we go and there's our proof completed okay so one final thing that I'd like to just for us to think about before the end of this session is the elegance of this proof so it's, a, it's actually quite a long proof as we can see here um, so something to think about when we're doing proofs is could we shorten this down could we are there redundant steps right, have we we've made a lot of reiterations could we have cut some of those out um, so let's think about how we could um, and there's there are lots of ways of proving this sequence um, and 
you know, a challenge for you after this session would be to go away and think about how you could shorten this down. I think it's doable in about 20 steps, maybe 20 to 22 steps. Um, I think you should be able to do it in about that. So here we've got 30, so we should be able to cut at least 8, maybe 10 steps out of this. Um, and let's just think about, just by looking at this proof, what we can see that we might be able to um, what we might be able to do to make it shorter. Well, something to think about is that could we, I mean, in a way, one way of making it more elegant is to make it look more elegant. Right, so rather than having two separate subproofs, right, we've got a second scope bar here uh, that then ends here, and then we we introduce another one. Could we do this all on, you know, in a kind of pyramid shape? So rather than having, you know, at the minute we've got something like this, we've got a long one and then a short one, and that gets us to answer. Could we instead, you know, and this is this has got stuff on it, so we've kind of got two pyramids. Um, Maybe we might think that that's an inelegant way of doing things. Maybe we could just have all of this done in just one pyramid shape, like that, right? So, you know, can we consolidate this all onto just onto onto less scope bars? That's going to make things more elegant. Um, and let's just think about that. I mean, we want to get to not A. So perhaps if we had have started the proof off, if this this proof here, this subproof from you know, starting with the assumption that, hey, if that had have gone from the very top, maybe we could have done all of the stuff that we did on this scope bar uh, just on that one line. Um, and now the only, I mean, we can look at it a bit more and think, uh, well, look, here we derived B, and that was something that we assumed. So maybe we could have derived B on this line and then done the stuff that we did when we assumed B uh, to get us to what we wanted. You know, however that's going to work. Sure, I mean, fine. Something that we're just going to have to do is just give it a try. Right, so we'll start a new scope bar. I'm in red at the minute. Uh, start a new scope bar. And zoom back in a little bit. So, not C and... A then B was our premise 1, 2 was not B, if and only if not F, and 3 was C or not F or G. So I think I've said this a couple of times, one of the enjoyable things about proofs is that they are just kind of like a puzzle that we can just set ourselves to and think, can I make this more elegant? Can I make a better proof than I already have here? Uh, and that's just going to involve trying some stuff out. So we, we already said, look, in this one we've got two, we've got kind of this uh, double pyramid shape. Right, we have one pyramid here, uh, that kind of reaches out, and, and in fact on this one we've got a double pyramid shape here too, right? We start with if we, we took this as the, we looked only at this scope bar, we've then got the assumption that not F giving us F, and then we do this disjunction elimination. Maybe we could do all of those steps just under the scope of the disjunction elimination, or something like that. Maybe we could, you know, reduce the amount of, I, I like thinking of them in terms of pyramids, these scope bars. Maybe we could reduce the peaks of our pyramids, uh, and that would give us a more elegant proof. Um, so in this case, we thought, well, look, maybe we could do all the work under just one uh, scope bar that began with with A. So just an indirect proof of A, uh, of not A, sorry. Maybe that will do all the work for us. So we'll just have to try that out and see what happens. So on line four, we'll assume A. Sorry, these are premises, aren't they? Premise, premise, premise. Uh, assumption. And then we'll just, you know, we'll just go from there. So we know that if we we'll have to reiterate not C and A then B from line 1. And that can give us A then B, which will give us B. So that was 5 conjunction elimination. And then that's 4 and 6 conditional elimination. So now we've got B on this same scope bar, and we need to get to some kind of uh, contradiction. 
Now what we did before is we used not b, so maybe we can just pick up this what we did to get not b here, right, we had this long proof where we started off with b, uh, maybe we can use the same kind of system, we can just pick this up uh, I don't know how to sort of show you this, if we just pick up all of this and kind of pop it down if we just cut all that out and, and put it here instead then we'd end up with, I mean this structure starting with the assumption that B um, that will lead us to not B, we've already seen that we can do that um, but maybe there, again, maybe there's a more elegant way of doing it um, we now know, we've now got B here what we did was assume B and allow, and that allowed us to make use of this biconditional but now we've got B straight away we can just reiterate up that biconditional not B if and only if not F that was from line 2 to get and use that subproof to get us to F right so on line 9 uh, if we assume going to need another subproof if we assume not f then not b if and only if not f gives us not b but we already know b is the case 10 11 12 so that's an assumption reiteration of uh, 2 and then in fact let's just Let's just stop there and think for a second that I just reiterated up not B if and only if not F, but then I've not made use of that biconditional here. I've had to reiterate it again. So this whole line here is unnecessary. Right, I don't need that at all. Uh, I can just get rid of that and then move up the rest of my proof. Uh, he says, then just move up this, take a little bit of renumbering, uh, but I shouldn't, you know, I, I, I've now, through getting rid of some reiteration that was unnecessary, um, I wasn't making use of that, you know, if you look in this proof, I do exactly the same thing, I assume B and then I uh, reiterate on line 5, not B, if and only if not F, um, but then I don't make use of that, right? When I reiterate it again, I could have just reiterated it straight from 2. Um, I kind of do a two-step thing. I go from there to there, and then I go up to here. But why didn't I just reiterate it straight to there? Wouldn't make any difference. So let's just do that. So on line 8, we'll have our assumption. Then 9, we'll just reiterate line 2, 10 and 11. So on line 12 we can write not not f, and on line 13 we can write f. So let's just fill in the blanks a bit. That's from 8, 9 by conditional elimination. That is from 7 uh, reiteration. And then this is 8, 10, 11 negation introduction. And that's 12 negation elimination. Okay, so what did we do with F? Well, if we look on this one, we turned it into F or G, and then that was a contradictory uh, formula to one of these disjuncts from premise 3. So let's just do the same thing. We'll just stick with what worked before. Uh, F or G, then we reiterate uh, C or not F or G. So now we can do our disjunction elimination to get to C. So I'm going to need to... that's 13 disjunction introduction and that is 3 reiteration. So I'm going to need to draw in a longer scope bar here. Oops, perhaps not that long. Um, so what did we do here? We C obviously leads... Uh, C entails C so we can just assume C there but then we're going to need to go from the other side so we need to get C from not F or G 
from that assumption. But, as we saw in the previous proof, we've got this nice subproof to use here where we've got two contradictory premises. So if we assume not C, then we can reiterate up F or G and not F or G. Uh, so that was an assumption. Let's just fill in my scope bar here a bit more. Turn to the bottom. Uh, okay, so I can do that, and that then allows me to write not not C, which allows me to write C. So that's 21, 22. So 21 is from 18, 19, and 20 negation introduction, and that's 21 negation elimination. And sorry, this was reiteration of 14 and the reiteration of 17. Okay, so now on line 22 I've got C. Uh, so that means that I can write that now on this main scope bar, right? I can get C here. So I've got C on my scope bar that begins with A. Um, so now all I need to do is reiterate this up, this not uh, in fact, I've already got that there, not C and A then B. I've already reiterated that up onto line 5, so I don't need to reiterate it again. I can just go from line 5 and do a conjunction elimination, line 24, to get not C. So that's going to be line 5, conjunction elimination. And sorry, this is a disjunction elimination of 15. So that's going to be 15, uh, 16 to 16, 17 to... Uh, what was it? 17 to 22, disjunction elimination. Uh, okay, and then I can do a conjunction elimination to get not C. And there we go, there's my two contradictory formulas, C and not C. So on line 25, I can write not A, because I've shown that this assumption of A led to these two contradictory premises. So there, just, just by moving this, making the proof itself look a little bit more elegant, um, if we zoom out a bit, you can see, hopefully, that in this case, it's a bit more messy, right? We've got, let's say, we've got this kind of two-pyramid structure to things. Um, we've got, you know, one subproof with uh, beginning with B, and then it ends, and then we've got another one that begins with A. Uh, in this case, everything's done on the subproof starting with A, uh, and that leads us to our contradiction. But again, this isn't, you know, we cut five steps out of that. We've made the proof uh, quite a good deal more elegant. But there's more work to be done here. There are other ways of doing this. Um, and I'm just going to leave you to think about other ways that you could approach this proof. So there's a little challenge for you. Have another go uh, at this proof and see how how much you can whittle it down, how elegant you can make it. There are lots of different approaches that we could take. Um, you know, another way that we could do it perhaps is we could uh, we could just go for a straight disjunction elimination. We could try and show that not A follows from both C and from not F or G. That would also be one way of thinking about it. And I don't know how many steps that's going to take. That's just something that we're going to need to try out and see how we do. Um, and again, that's the fun of a proof <laughs> in a way is, is just giving it a go. So go and have a go at that. Um, I'll just write out again the final, uh, what the the proof itself was. So it was uh, not C and A then B, not B if and only if not F, and C or not F or G, then not A. So bear in mind those useful subproofs that we've gone through and the different ways that you know if we add in a negation here or there how that's going to affect it how things need to change around um, and just give some stuff a go have a go yourself and see how short you can make that proof as a as a challenge for yourself in your revision and i'll leave it there for this week <laughs>